Celebration was the town out of a movie. Picturesque houses, perfectly manicured lawns, and white picket fences that seemed more welcoming than any other neighborhood in America. And for good reason. Celebration was made to create a safe, happy, and seemingly perfect town, where neighbors would relax on their porch at sunset and talk to each other the way they used to. Or at least, that's the way the movies made it seem they used to. If you have already watched our video on the Tot family murders that happened in 2019, then you are well aware of Celebration, and many of the things they did to keep up the facade of the perfect place to live. Things like hiding speakers in the trees so they could play bird songs 24-7, rain or shine, importing dry leaves in the fall to make the atmosphere feel more autumnal, or even importing snow and simulating snowfall despite being in Florida. The town was built on the idea of perfect. The idea that everything looks a certain way, and if everything was just like in the Disney movies, that the world would be a better place. Crime rates would cease to exist. Vandalism would be a thing of the past. If everyone was just given perfection, they too would be perfect. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Some people moved to Celebration because they loved Disney, and they loved what the park represented. They wanted to be closer to the magic, and being that the park was just five minutes drive away, they were more than happy to pay an arm and a leg to move there. Others moved because they believed in the premise. They thought that modernity was getting in the way of real American values, and they wanted to live in a community that strove to be more than just a place to hang their hats at the end of the day. They bought into the Leave it to Beaver old sitcom way of living, and they felt recognized by it. And still, other people moved there because it was a perfect cover, an amazing disguise that would serve to shield them from any problems that may arise in their life. In today's episode of Dreading, brought to you by Fiverr, we are going to be discussing the axe murder of Matteo Patrick Giovendito, described by many as a charismatic, friendly, and amazing teacher, was exposed in death for his past crimes against students and how he used Disney to do it. Not a lot is known about Matteo's life before he was killed in 2010. In fact, so little is known that former students and people who knew him recalled how, even before he had died, they would try to find him in order to reconnect with him, but found he was like a ghost. They would Google him, hoping to get a hint of how he was doing, where he ended up, and what had happened to him, only to be greeted with nothing. No news reports, no school website celebrating their employee of the month, nothing. This struck them as odd, since he had been an early adopter of the internet and spent so much time instilling the potential of the World Wide Web to his class. And yet, before his untimely death, any Google search would yield no results. No personal ads, no article about outstanding work, nothing. After his passing, though, a few people did finally come forward and give statements about how Matteo really was as a person, and how he was like before he passed, which showed him in a very different light than before. His stepfather had been famed mafioso Frederick Ciampe, who was part of the Patriarca crime family, specifically the faction located in Boston. Frederick was part of the mob in their heyday, when they were running the streets and controlling the entire area. And while Fred was able to provide for the family with money and material possessions, he was less than a good father figure for Matteo. It's widely believed that Fred hit Matteo and his mother, though the extent of which is unknown. However, what is known is that some event happened within the family that caused them to force Matteo to separate from them completely, even going so far as to pay him to leave them alone. Whatever this event was, we don't know, as his extended family refused to talk about it. But every month until he died, Matteo was earning a significant amount of money that afforded him an extremely comfortable lifestyle, a lifestyle that included taking weekend trips to Disney World, Disneyland, Mexico, Canada, and more. While it's unconfirmed by Matteo in any official way, his colleagues and former students would state that they believed that Matteo had been abused used heavily throughout his childhood, and because of that abuse, felt as if he wasn't able to fully experience being a kid. He would never truly open up about his home and family life when he was around others. However, he always seemed to allude to a childhood that was filled with violence, hurt, and suffering. He wasn't able to experience the feeling of not having responsibilities or fear. Growing up, he was constantly worried about his family, his actions, and trying to behave in a way that would please his stepfather and ensure his safety. He didn't have time to focus on being a kid, going to the movies, or watching cartoons. Because of that trauma, his colleagues believed that Gia Vendito lived in a state of arrested development, and that was why he related more to kids and teens. He felt as if he was understood more by them, that he didn't need to explain himself to them, and they simply just got each other. Meanwhile, he was stiff and uncomfortable around adults, refusing to touch or interact with them more than what was acceptable. And like most predators do, this led Mateo into a profession that would allow him to be around kids and teens 24-7, allowing him full-time access to them, while also having the ability to control them, without fear of being deemed odd. It should also be mentioned that Gia Vendito would lie about his life to his peers, students, for reasons unknown. Though him being related to mobsters and being paid a monthly stipend from his family to never speak to them again would later turn out to be true. He would also pepper in seemingly random statements about his life that were fabrications, 
simply because he could. During his career, he would tell his peers that he was previously married and that his wife left him, despite being a gay man who had never been in any romantic relationship with a woman. In fact, most people who knew him never witnessed him in any romantic relationship at all. And while people didn't think much of it at the time, it seemed as though, through all his lies, Giovandito was laying the groundwork for a defense as to why he wouldn't do the crimes he would later be accused of. Mateo started his teaching career in the 70s, at the Villa Oasis Boarding School in Arizona, where he would live on campus, in a home attached to the boys' dormitory. He later relocated to Florida in 1981, where he taught at Lerman Day School in Miami Beach. He then became the headmaster at the Crossroads School for Kids with ADHD that was located in Davie, Florida. It was at these jobs he would find his victims, victims that would not feel safe coming forward until after his death. Oftentimes, in cases involving child abuse or exploitation of children, the perpetrator will purposely seek out jobs that will not only put him in contact with teens and kids, but seek out jobs that make them an authority figure in their life. They will ingratiate themselves into the children's lives, first just as a teacher, and then as a sort of confidant and friend. They will focus their time and attention on them, making them feel special and seen, usually in ways that the child isn't getting at home or in their life otherwise. It's unfortunate but true that predators will be able to seek out children who have less than stellar home lives or seem to lack a certain support system. That way the child is more trusting, can be manipulated easier, and the parents are often too busy to notice any particular changes in their child. The victim will crave attention and admiration being given to them by the perpetrator. They will start craving the affirmation and assurance that they get from the predator and start living their lives in a way to gain more of it. Subconsciously, they will begin to fear their new friend leaving them or being disappointed in them. And so, when asked to do sexual activities or anything that makes them uncomfortable, they will do it without question because they are more scared of them leaving than anything else. And say, for example, their parents were to start noticing changes in behavior, questioning the friendship, or states that they are uncomfortable with the relationship, Relationship, predator has a built-in defense. I do this with all my students. I'm just being a good teacher. And depending upon the age, if there are any significant changes in behavior, he'll simply remind them that their son is a teenager and is supposed to be moody. Don't worry about them. I will take care of them. In the bevy of stories that have come out surrounding this case, parents of the children that were victimized have written emotional posts online about this experience and how they were likewise manipulated by Mateo into thinking that their kid was just becoming a teenager and that everything was fine. They realized that he had told their children that their parents obviously knew about the abuse taking place because they had allowed him into their life, allowed him to take them overseas and more. These posts are heartbreaking to read and unfortunately are not rare. As mentioned earlier, Mateo felt more at ease with kids and once he became a teacher through a bit of trial and error, he found a way to gain their and their parents' trust. One parent described how their son was going through a hard time before entering his class. His home life had been shaken by a tragic event and she had signed him up for a big brother program in their area, only for him not to like the people he was paired with. Upon meeting Mr. G, she informed him of this and how she was looking for a person to mentor her son and on the queue, Mateo offered his services. He asked her if she was comfortable with him taking on the position and, due to his position at the school, she said yes. She was also a private investigator and spent time going through his back background and found nothing to say he was dangerous. Through the next four years, she described him as part of the family. He was able to help her son in school, improve his grades, and he seemed to be in better spirits. She saw a profound shift in him, until one day, four years later, her son was adamant that he wanted nothing to do with Mateo anymore, out of seemingly nowhere. He informed his mother that he didn't want to speak with Mr. G, that if he were to call home to say he wasn't there and to not bring him over to Mr. G's house anymore. At the time, she thought it was mildly rude, but little did she know what had actually occurred. His students would talk about how great of a teacher he was and how much they loved his classes. He was one of the most beloved teachers at every school he taught at, so much so that in the 1985 yearbook of Lerman's school, they wrote this dedication to him. Dedication. For the 1985 edition of the yearbook, we would like to acknowledge many of the people who make Lerman Day School what it is today, a fantastic, well-run, and dynamic school. Among those people who make this learning environment work are, of course, the teachers. We are taking this opportunity to honor one of the most respected teachers in the school. His name is Patrick Giovandito. Mr. G is the social studies teacher for the junior high. He also runs the student council, the supply store, and the computer program. He is loved by all his students and fellow teachers. This is because he is an experienced, talented, and compassionate man. But more importantly, he is a friend who always has time for his students. Even if he is busy, he finds time to help other people. A jack of all trades, a master of many talents, an educator in the pure sense of the word. A man all students look up to with respect, admiration, and affection. This is Reflection's choice for our dedication. They would describe his classroom as being more of a playroom, filled with toys and things to do. They would say he was more of a kid than they were, and he seemed to just understand them. Other kids would describe how he was the first teacher to take an interest in them academically, and how they wanted to perform 
performed to their best of their abilities when they were in his class. If you were struggling in school, Mr. G would sit you down and talk to you and really care. He'd ask you how things were at home, how you were dealing with your parents' divorce, and what was going on with your mom's new job. How did you feel now that she wasn't around as much? He'd speak to you with understanding, relating to what you were going through. And because of that, many students felt like he was the only adult they could truly, truly trust. They had no idea how he planned to pervert that trust. Mr. G, as he was known to his students, went above and beyond for his class, often taking groups of them away to trips to Disney World, Disneyland, the Everglades, Mexico, and more, just because he could. Most of these trips were small, little over the weekend escapades, where he and a small group of kids would travel to some location on a whim, almost every other week. He would enter the classroom and tell them about a trip he had coming up, something fun that he had spontaneously decided he wanted to do. Who would like to go to Mexico with me this weekend, he'd say, or who's up for a trip to Disney World on me, and then send around a sign-up sheet for the kids who would of course sign up, wanting nothing more than to spend a weekend in the happiest place on earth. In multiple instances, if a kid seemed to want to go, but they couldn't afford it, he let the parents know it was on him. No worries. This was especially true if he had taken a special interest in the student and wanted to, quote, bring out the best in him. While this practice is balked at now as being strange and obviously not okay, parents described feeling comfortable with these trips because they thought they were done with the school. Their kids would run home and ask, hey, can I go to Disney World this weekend with my teacher? A bunch of kids are going and I need your permission and without thinking anything more of it, they would say of course. They were under the impression that it was school sanctioned, that these trips had something to do with classwork, and seeing as there was a big group going, they felt as if there was nothing wrong with it. It, of course, wasn't school sanctioned. In fact, the school had no part in these actions and often didn't know and didn't know Giovandito was taking the students out of the country. At the time, no one complained about these trips or Mr. G's teaching style. However, there were more people who thought it was a bit strange. As previously stated, Mateo was standoffish and aloof with other adults. He was straightforward with them, letting them know he didn't like to be touched, and when he did engage with them, it was clear that he was uncomfortable. Other teachers tried to get to know him, asking him to sit with them at lunch, and they tried to build up a friendship with him, only for it to go completely silent. And as mentioned, he was the complete opposite with the kids. They chalked it up to his past, of which they knew very little, but determined he was just an odd guy, trying to regain the childhood he never had. He just got along better with the kids more than the adults. That's why he seemed to spend so much time with his male students, and whatever it was he was going to do seemed to bring out the best in the kids. So the school, for the most part, thought nothing of it. It didn't escape notice that Gia Vendito seemed to have favorites in the class every year. As mentioned earlier, he would usually set his sights on one student in particular, a student who may be struggling academically or is the subject of gossip among Amongst the teachers for their particular home life. He would observe them for a bit, watching how they would interact with others, and figure out how it was best to approach them. After a while, he would start helping them, either with their schoolwork or their home life, letting them know he had taken a special interest in them and wants to see them succeed. These students were always, without question, male, and through their own retelling of events, they always felt incredibly cared for by the teacher. In fact, in one of the only articles about the subject, multiple of his former victims go on to explain what it was like to be preyed upon by him, saying, Before Mr. G, no no one had really taken an interest in me academically, probably because I was a pretty quiet kid. D, a married professional living in South Florida, said in a telephone interview. He did. He got me interested in learning. He pushed me to excel. Why don't you try to get an A? He made me want to become a good student. The article goes on to quote another victim of Gio Vendito when it states, One of Gio Vendito's lost causes at the villa was William Wilder's. He was one of the first people to say that he saw potential in me, Wilder said in a telephone interview. He helped me stay out of trouble because I tended to look for it. He made me come to his office and stay there and do homework. My dad wasn't in the picture, and he kind of stepped in there for me for three years. Other teachers noticed the pattern, and how it seemed like every year Mr. G would have a young boy under his wing. One of his fellow teachers from Villa Oasis, the boarding school he began his career at, talked about how he always seemed to gravitate to young boys, choosing to spend most of his time with them. She stated, Clearly he was more oriented to the boys than to the girls, she recalled. He always picked the most vulnerable. He loved trying to take a lost cause and make them succeed. It was junior high boys. He picked one to take under his wing. She even went on to recall recall how, at the time, they were working together. Mateo had been living on campus, in a room that connected to the boys' dormitory. According to multiple victims that had come out posthumously, Mr. G had a quick and succinct plan on how to prey on his students. After picking one or two boys out of the class, he would engage with them on their level, spend extra time with them, getting them to trust him, making sure that they felt seen and heard by him. He would be sure to pick boys who seemed to be lacking any strong male presence in their life because he knew it would be easier to gain their trust that way. He would flood them with praise, attention, and presence in the form of trips, something they were not used to, and would start talking to them as a friend, not as a teacher. He would bring up sexual subjects like masturbation under the guise that it's just what young guys talk about, and everyone talks about this, making them feel more comfortable with the notion of talking like that with their teacher. He would 
would quote unquote teach them how to touch themselves and after a bit would essentially dare them to get him off which they would do because they had been primed to think that this is normal in male relationships after that he would start preying on them more often using trips to disney and mexico as exertions specifically for sexual encounters and because he had such an active caring presence in the boy's life their parents wouldn't notice a thing. If the boy started acting out or misbehaving, or stating he no longer wanted to hang out with Mr. G, he'd assure the parents that this is because he was turning into a teenager. Nothing more, nothing less. And usually, because of how their parents had given their permission to hang out with them, that would lead to them being preyed upon. Most of the victims of Giovandito that they thought their parents knew, and didn't care, leading to them never openly telling anyone about it after it happened. At the time, his actions didn't appear predatory to anyone around him, and according to everyone at the school he worked at, his record was spotless, with not one complaint about inappropriate behavior coming in. The only time someone around him seemed to feel odd about his actions, and how he seemed to gravitate towards younger boys, was when one of his former students became a colleague of his. Peter Klein had been a student of Giovandito when he was teaching at Lerman, and then later worked alongside him when he moved to Crossroads. He had remembered Giovandito as an amazing teacher, who always took time to be with his students, and let them know he cared. He also recalled the lavish trips that he would take the class on, and how much fun they were when he attended. However, as an adult and as a teacher, he began to realize how odd that practice was. He was now in the position that Mr. G had been in all those years ago, working long days with large groups of rowdy children, trying to get them to care about what he had to say, and he realized just how exhausting it was. It was only then, as he realized how hard the job was and how thankless it was, how little sense it made for him to spend his own money to take his class on trips. But Peter's discomfort wasn't enough to file a complaint, and after years of teaching, Giovandito finally retired and moved to Celebration, into the home where he would later be killed with an axe. After Matteo Patrick Giovandito retired from teaching and preying on his students, he made the decision to move his operation into Disney World's premier perfect town, Celebration. Much like Celebration, Mr. G had been putting up a facade his entire life. The perfect teacher who cared about his students, who never wanted anything more from them than their respect. His affinity with all things Disney, and the fact that he had used the Disney parks as a place to prey on unsuspecting students, made the move even more fitting. However, because he had retired and moved on from any activity where he would be in the company of young boys, he found himself at a loss. He would have to find a new way to find victims, in a way that wouldn't lead his neighbors of suspecting him of anything unbecoming, which was much more important in celebration than other places. Seeing as the town had a list of over a hundred rules for their residents to follow to continue to appear perfect to the outside. Luckily for Mateo, he had been an early adopter of computers, and in kind, the internet. Despite the fact that any information on him prior to his murder is non-existent online, Mateo had been one of the first people to buy an at-home computer, and two out of his three email addresses were simply one character long, meaning he had two of the first 28 emails ever. He was hyper aware that the internet could be used to find people, namely men, who were looking for a short-term companion. He started making posts on Craigslist, looking for a companion to come and keep him company during the nights. And when that didn't pan out, he would drive around town in his black Corvette, stopping every so often to ask a group of men for directions, and then see if they wanted to come back to his place in order to do some odd job for him. The jobs varied from day to day, from fixing a door frame to changing his pipes, etc. If the man agreed, he'd drive him back to his home, show him the problem, and offer him a beer, drugged with a sleeping agent. After drinking together, and the man passing out, Mateo would assault the man, take his shoes, photograph them, and his feet, clean him up, and leave him to sleep it off for a while, until the man woke up. He then explained what happened, that they had simply passed out after one beer, with nothing of note really happening. Usually still in the impaired state, Mateo would drive them home, never to see or speak to them again, with them not really knowing anything of what had happened. However, his neighbors were seeing young men come and go almost daily, with some of these men appearing to be a little worse for wear. Again, this was Disney's perfect community, where autumn leaves are trucked in, bird songs are played through hidden speakers, and neighbors are encouraged to talk to each other through the design of the streets. Having men who looked like they had been picked up off the streets and drugged were bound to stand out, but Mateo had thought of a reason for that. When he talked to his neighbors in celebration, he would explain that while he was a retired teacher, he had a passion for outreach work, and he would counsel young men dealing with the drug and dependency problems. Every time they saw a new man sitting on his porch with him in the morning, looking dazed and in the same clothes they had been wearing the day before, it was just Mateo counseling them, trying to get them on the straight and narrow, because he was a good person. This led to him getting the nickname in the community Community, Mother Teresa, a nickname that would prove to be entirely false. November 25th was a day like any other. 
Mateo had decided once more that he wanted to find a man to help him with his housework and set about on his way, driving around Orlando to find someone he deemed acceptable. While driving, Mateo found David Israel Zenon Murillo, a 30-year-old transient on the street, and set his sights firmly on him. Mateo pulled his convertible over and propositioned David, saying he needed someone to wash his Corvette and that he was willing to pay David a good amount of money to do so. David, being out of work and homeless, thought it was a good enough offer. David also mentally took note of the fact that he could physically dominate Mateo if need be, which assured him that getting into the man's car and going home with him wouldn't be too dangerous. Mateo drove them both to his home, and upon arriving, before David could start washing his car, he offered him a drugged beer. They sat on the porch together until David succumbed to the drugs, and Mateo quickly got to work. He took off David's shoes and photographed them along with his feet. He placed David's shoes in the closet, got on top of David, and started to strip him. When David, groggy and still drugged, woke up, realizing what was going on, he pushed Mateo off him angrily and set about leaving. Still heavily drugged and furious. David stumbled about the home trying to find his shoes. Mateo tried to assure him to convince him that nothing had happened and everything was okay, that he had simply passed out and more, but David knew better. Despite his young appearance, he was 30. He had had his fair share of beers before and knew that one was not enough to make him pass out, much less feel the way he was feeling. As Mateo continued to try and convince him that nothing was wrong, that he was okay, and that he could just sleep it off, David continued going through the house, trying to find his shoes so he could leave. He was beyond angry at this point. This man had drugged him, tried to assault him, and instead of giving him his shoes, one of his only real possessions, he was trying to pretend like nothing had happened, that everything was fine and he should just keep going back to sleep. The more Mateo talked, the angrier David Israel got. And finally, when he found his shoes in the back of the closet, he snapped. Next to his shoes was an axe, which David decided would work just fine as a weapon. He put his shoes back on, grabbed the axe, and then, without stopping to think, he bludgeoned Mateo three times with the axe, before getting a shoelace and strangling him with it to ensure that he was dead. According to Murillo, as he strangled Giovandito with a shoelace, he whispered in his ear, you've been a bad boy lately, you ran into the wrong guy this time, bro. After killing Mr. G, Murillo cleaned himself up and left the home. It would be four days until Mateo Mateo's body was found when the neighbors worried about not seeing him. Neighbors were horrified at the murder. How could this happen here in celebration, the self-sufficient community of the future? In the news coverage about the murder and the immediate dates following, the press emphasized just how tragic this event was, how this burst the bubble of perfection in celebration, and how Mateo, and how Mateo was a lovely retiree who dedicated his life to helping others and making the world a better place. They spoke highly of him, and what they could to make sure that the readers knew that the man who had been murdered was anything but deserving. However, as days continued on and Marilla was found, more and more information started pouring out. Older students who had been abused started to post online about their experiences with him. Families of the students he had preyed upon made their own statements about how he had gained their trust and taken these children on vacations meant to prey on them and so much more. Quickly the tide turned and people realized and people realized what or rather who this person really was and why he died the way he did. As for David Israel, he was found guilty of the murder and sentenced to life in prison, which ended up being a topic of debate for many people. Some believed that he acted in self-defense because Mateo had obviously drugged him and was trying to get him to stay with him so he could continue to assault him. People felt by and large the punishment was too harsh, especially given Mateo's history of assaulting minors. Regardless, this murder forever shook celebration and is more or less the reason why the next death of the sinister suburb occurred. If you are interested in hearing about that, leave a comment down below. If there are any other topics you are interested in, feel free to leave that in the comments as well or email us at the email on screen now. And hopefully we'll see you in our next video. Stay safe and goodbye.